1 Samuel 16 tells us a story of David. And I want to jump into this passage. We're going to jump in right in the middle of one specific story in the life of David. But there's a reason I want to go there today. Today I want to bring you a message called The Process of Progress. The Process of Progress. You know, we've preached and and taught a lot of faith messages over the last few weeks. Pastor Gary brought a great series called How's Life, where we talked about not dying in the wilderness, but instead stepping in faith into everything that God has for our lives. And then, man, what a Sunday we had last weekend as we celebrated our 40th anniversary as a church, people stepping out in faith, coming forward for prayer, God, the Holy Spirit, grabbing their hearts and saying, I have more for you. I'm going to meet you where you are. I'm calling you into something greater, and people stepping out in faith coming forward as we all prayed together. There's been so many moments of faith over the last few weeks here in our church. And I love it when God answers prayers instantaneously, but how many of you know that sometimes God doesn't always answer my prayer right when I ask? Sometimes he makes me walk out a process of faith. Am I the only one who's discovered this? And I wanna look at a journey of faith and even waiting, if you will, that we find in 1 Samuel 16. The story goes far beyond that, but we see it first here in 1 Samuel 16. And again, the title of the message is The Process of Progress, but if you wanted to write down a subtitle for this message, it would be this, what to do when waiting. What to do when waiting for God to answer. One of my favorite songs is by Tom Petty, and it says this, the waiting is the hardest part. If I told you that, if I invited you into something, but then I said, okay, come on over, and then I said, hold on, wait. Nobody likes to wait. Everybody gets frustrated because we tend to get drained during the waiting. But what if we could be joyful rather than drained during our season of waiting? See, when you look at scripture, we discover that God wants us to continue to walk out a path that can be full of joy even if we find ourselves waiting. So that's what I wanna talk to you about today. How to find joy, not be drained during our season of waiting. So in 1 Samuel 16, God tells Samuel, he says, I want you to go to Bethlehem. I want you to find a man named Jesse. He's got sons. One of those sons is going to be the next king of Israel. So fill up your horn with oil. Take it with you, and I'll show you which one is the one that's going to be the next king. So Samuel gets to Jesse's house, and Jesse has lined up his sons. But he's about to find out that all of his sons are not there because as he goes down the line, the one that God has chosen isn't present. So look at what happens next, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is. It's like David was somewhere close in sight, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Verse 12, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. This word in the King James in the original writings, it means he was most likely of red hair, red complexion, maybe with freckles. But then it goes on to say that he has bright eyes and he's good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took, by the way, I should pause right there and say, for all the people that felt like the redheaded stepchild, maybe this is your moment. You just might be someone that God has chosen to do something great, amen? (laughs) Anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord, notice these words, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. If you're taking notes this morning, I got four thoughts for you today to take home with you, okay? Number one, if you want to write this down, when waiting in faith, remember, the favor that is on you is greater than the questions that surround you. When waiting in faith, remember, the favor that is on you is greater than the questions that might surround you. When you look at this passage of scripture, we see that David is anointed to be the next king of Israel. But here's the bad news. It was going to be 15 to 20 more years before David would be appointed as the king. So this is a moment of anointing, but his time of appointing has not yet come. And again, I don't mean this to be discouraging to anyone at all, but one thing I've learned in my life is that God doesn't always answer my prayers at the exact moment that I ask them and pray them. Sometimes I walk out a process of faith. In fact, I've learned that while God will sometimes answer that prayer quickly or even instantaneously, he will often ask me to walk out a journey of faith and patience. Everybody say patience. Don't you just love that word? 
Everybody wants to have patience, but nobody wants to go through the process of gaining and earning patience because it's not fun. And when you look at the, the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews gives us a really simple instruction, and I'll just reference this real quick. He says that we should not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. So guess what? If we want to step into everything that God has for our lives, it might be a big picture calling. It might mean a small moment of something we're believing for. God is going to require faith and quite often patience if we want to inherit the promises of God. Now, let's talk for a moment about the anointing because we said we have to remember that what's on us is greater than the questions that surround us. In this picture, David has been anointed to be the next king of Israel. God would send the prophet and say, fill up your horn with oil. When that horn was poured over David's head, it was symbolic of the spirit of God, the favor of God, the presence of God coming upon David in that moment. And suddenly now, he's anointed today to do something that he will be appointed to do tomorrow. He's not appointed yet, but get this picture. The anointing is already upon him. The spirit of God has come upon him. And see, I believe that over the last few weeks in our church, the Holy Spirit of God has been speaking to people, been coming upon people and showing them, I have something for you that's better than what you've been walking through. You've been dealing with something. You've been walking through a difficult situation or circumstance. And it's like the Holy Spirit comes upon us, bears witness with us and tells us that God has something better than what we are currently walking through. And for many of us, we look ahead and we say, God, I believe you've got better days for me down the road, or I believe you're calling me to something that's greater than what I currently stand in. And it's in those moments that we have to stop and recognize that while we might not yet be appointed, God has already anointed us with his favor. So no matter the questions that might surround us, we must remember that the favor that's upon us is greater than the questions that surround us. Amen? Now, I don't, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but just follow me for a minute because David had to go back to the shepherd field. He didn't go to the palace. He went back to the pasture. And he didn't know it was going to be 15 to 20 years. But I wonder in those moments as David was tending sheep, he's saying the favor of God, the anointing of God is already on me. And the questions might have gone like this. God, how long is it going to be? And what's that path going to look like? What's my dad going to say? What are my brothers going to say? What are my friends going to say? What's the current king going to say? What's the nation going to say? Are they going to be good to me? Are they going to be bad to me? David had no idea what was in front of him. See, when we walk through seasons of mystery where we can easily be surrounded and even overcome by questions, we have to come back and remember that the favor that is upon us is greater than the questions that surround us. And it was like David probably went back to the pasture and told himself day in and day out, David, I know you got a lot of questions. I know you got a lot of questions. I know you got a lot of questions, but you don't need to know all of it now. All you need to know is that the favor that's on you is greater than the questions that surround you. Amen. And we have to remind ourselves in seasons of waiting that what God has put on us, the anointing he's put upon us, the promises that he's made us are greater than the questions that surround us. Paul wrote it this way in 2 Corinthians 1. He said that all the promises of God are yes and amen. Let me read this to you in the NIV real quick because it helps it to illustrate it even better. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Do you know what that means? That means that if God made you a promise over the last few weeks and you are still waiting to receive it, God said yes in heaven, and in order for a yes to become yes on earth, we have to be the ones who choose to walk out the amen path. So be it in my life. I'm going to hold on to your promises. What's on me is greater than the questions that surround me, and I'm not going to let go of this thing. Now, last thing before we move to the next section. I, I was driving my kids to school earlier this week, and we drive across town to get there. And so I open up Waze, because that's the navigation app that I like to use, and I've used this illustration before, but man, did it ring true this week. I open up Waze to tell me what's the quickest way to get the kids to school, and it tells me this is the quickest path. So I get on the freeway, and pretty soon, a few minutes later, I find myself sitting dead still in traffic, and I'm like, this is the quickest way to get there? You see, 
In that moment, the reason why the navigation app Waze that I was using is telling me that that's the quickest way to get there is because it doesn't just see where I currently am. It knows about the traffic that's in front of me. And see, it's able to see from a global satellite picture, see the whole board in a way that I can't from the one place that I currently am. Does this make sense to everyone? And what's funny about it is I'm, as I'm sitting there on the freeway, I'm thinking to myself, this can't be the fastest way. I'm not even moving. But do you know what I've learned? Is that movement and progress are not always the same thing. And see, sometimes when we don't see movement the way that we want when it comes to what we're believing for, we start to take matters in our own hand and say, nope, I ain't going that way, God. I'm about to go this way. And all the while, God, just like Waze, is laughing, saying, but I know the best way to get there. Because you see what you see now, but I see the whole board from a satellite perspective. Can I tell you something? You might not see movement right now, but that doesn't mean you're not making progress. God has you right where he wants you. Hold on to his promises. Hold on to his word. And remember that what's upon you is greater than the questions that surround you. God is taking you to your destination. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, so let's keep reading and move to the next thing. Look at verse 14 of 1 Samuel 16. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So if you don't know this, Saul is the current king. He was the first king of Israel. The spirit of the Lord has come upon David, but here it says that the spirit of the Lord has departed from Saul. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled Saul. We're not even going to get into the theology of all that right now. Verse 15, and Saul's servants said to him, surely a a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. So let's pause right there for just a moment, and I want to give you the second point, second thought this morning, okay? Number two, when waiting in faith, remember, God just might be working in ways that I'm not seeing. God just might be working in ways that I'm not seeing. Now again, verse 13 tells us that the Spirit of the Lord had come powerfully upon David. And verse 14 tells us that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, the first king of Israel. Notice what's happening simultaneously. The spirit of the Lord, the the favor of the Lord leaves one man and it comes down powerfully upon another. Now, let me just ask you a couple of questions real quick. Saul might have known that the spirit of the Lord was leaving him because he went through a whole lot of torment, but did he know that the spirit of the Lord was also now coming upon David at the same time? Probably not. But what about this? David knew that the spirit of the Lord was coming upon him. He was just anointed to be the next king. But did he know that at the same time, the spirit of the Lord was now departing from the current king, Saul? Answer, no, probably not. What's the point? Sometimes God is doing things behind the scenes that we just can't see with our own eyes. We can't see what God's doing all the time. Even though we would love to see what he's doing, we don't always see it. And when we walk through seasons of waiting, we must remember that God just might be working in ways that I'm not seeing. I love Pastor Gary. He has this great quote. I love Pastor Gary. I love this great quote that Pastor Gary has is what I meant to say. Love you, Dad. Um, (laughs) One of my favorite Pastor Gary quotes, and you guys have heard this before, I'm certain, is that when we find ourselves in seasons of waiting, we think, God, when's this gonna happen? How's it gonna happen? Why don't you do it now? What we don't see is that God is moving furniture around in the universe in order to get us right where he wants us to be. And within this this point in this, this section of the message, I thought long and hard about this this week, and I was really trying to think of a personal illustration, and it took a long time for one to come to me, but then it's like God brought a good one to my heart. I remember in 2004, I was, you know, a year or two into just really getting my life together and serving Jesus again, and God brought me to this church. I didn't grow up in the Temecula Valley. My dad was on staff here at this church, and I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Corona, and my dad was like, hey, you should come out and check it out, and pretty soon I moved out here, and this became my home church for two years until 2006, the summer of 2006. I felt like God called me to move to Orange County and be a part of a church plant there. Now, in that church plant, I met my wife. I ended up going to Australia in the middle of it and finishing Bible school. I met lifelong friends that to this day are still great friends. And that season was like a seven-year season that was really significant in my life. But 
During that season, I found myself looking back at the two years that I spent in this church, and I would often think this, God, why did you take me to that church just for those two years? And see, what I didn't know then that I know now is that God brought me to this church not just as a safe place to land where I could grow in my faith and have community. God brought me to this church because God knew then that one day I needed to have perspective on the history of our church. And I learned things during the two years that I spent in this church about our history of faith, the foundation and roots of faith and the faith message that this church was built upon. I met our founding pastors who became friends even until the time that Pastor Roger died. And I think back and I was like, God, those two years in in that time, they felt like strange years, but God knew exactly what he was doing. Can I tell you something right now? God knows exactly what he's doing. He's got you exactly where he wants you to be. You might not understand it right now, but one day you're gonna get to a place that you couldn't have gone before because God still needed to move some furniture around in order for you to get there. God might be moving right now in ways that you can't currently see. So when you find yourself in a difficult season of waiting, Remember that God might be moving in ways that I'm not seeing. God might be playing 4D chess in a way that you never could right now to get you to the place he's calling you to go. God knows what he's doing. He knows the right route. He knows the right timeline, and he's gonna get you to the place that he's calling you. Amen? Amen. So don't give up in waiting. Even if I don't see it, you will. Anyway, don't worry. I'm not gonna sing. I'm not gonna sing. All right, let's move to the third section here, okay? Before we read in verse 16, remember, Saul, the spirit of the Lord has departed from King Saul, the first king of Israel. And now there's a tormenting or distressing spirit that's just bothering him over and over. Look at verse 16. This is what his servants say. They say, let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who's a skillful player on the harp. Hmm, I wonder who that might be. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you. And then you shall be well. So in other words, they're saying, there's clearly a spirit, an evil spirit that's tormenting you. If only we could find a skillful musician to come in here and play, perhaps when that evil spirit comes upon you, this will set your soul and your spirit at ease. Look at verse 17. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, look, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person. And the Lord is with him. Now watch this in verse 19. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, and notice these words, who is with the sheep. Now, does that make David up to sound like a pretty significant guy? No, he's the shepherd boy out in the field. But send for your son David that he may come to you, the son of yours who's out with the sheep. Here's the third thought I wanna share with you this morning, okay? Number three, when waiting in faith, remember to be faithful in your field. Be faithful in your field. I love this. After David was anointed to be king, he didn't just immediately move to the palace. He didn't try to overthrow authority. He didn't try to get ahead of God's timing. He didn't try to do any of those things. Instead, he didn't assume power. He waited 15 to 20 more years before he would become king. And this hasn't even happened in the story just yet. But here's the point. Verse 19 tells us that after being anointed, when David runs back to the, the, the pasture, Really what he's doing is he's not just watching out for some sheep, he's watching out for his father's sheep. And when Saul comes calling for him, he's found in the field serving his father. I'm gonna say this again, hopefully you'll pick up on the theme here. He's found in the field serving his father. You see, when God places things in front of us that are bigger and more significant, we often look at our current season and feel as though it is small and insignificant. But in the same way that David went back to tend to the sheep, oh my gosh, you guys gotta catch this. In the same way that David went back to tend to the sheep that his father had entrusted him with in that season, we too must recognize that our heavenly father is watching to see how how we will tend to what he has entrusted us with in this season. Now, some people are clapping, but some people are like, well, I don't like what God's entrusted me with in this season. 
And oftentimes, because we think of the season we're in as being small and insignificant, we don't steward it well. So as a result, we don't get promoted into the season that God has for us in the future. But when Saul went looking for David, where was he? He was out in the field stewarding what his father had entrusted him with. Can I just ask you this morning, how well are you stewarding the thing that your father has entrusted you with right now so that you can step into the promotion he has for you in the future? This hits home for me. I'm not preaching at you. Come on, we're all in the same boat this morning. Everybody with me? See, faithfulness in my current season will result in promotion in my next season. How many people get, well, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I know there's people in the house. You're looking for a better opportunity. You're looking for promotion. You're looking for new things in front of you. You're saying, God, I need something bigger. I need something more significant. Perhaps what the Lord would say right now in this moment is, okay, and I want to promote you to that, but how well are you stewarding the thing I've entrusted to you in your current season? Because if we're faithful with the things that God's entrusted us with in the current season, he will promote us into the things he has for us in the next. Amen? When waiting in faith, I must choose to be faithful in my field. Psalm 75 says that promotion does not come come from the north, south, east, or west. Eh. North, south, east, or west, but promotion comes from the Lord. If we'll be faithful with the thing that God has entrusted to us today, God will bring us promotion in the season that is ahead. And I thought of a good story here for this one too because it was probably eight years ago, I think. Uh, We, I wasn't a part of this process at the time, but Pastor Corey and Amber, our generation's pastors, we hired them uh, right around Christmas break before Easter. And so during that season, Pastor Corey was serving at another church and he had talked to his pastor. He said, you know, I feel like there's a new season on the horizon. I just want you to be aware of that. I want you to know that. He was great about it. And then when the time came that we had made a connection with Pastor Corey, you know, we'd made a great connection with his pastor, and it was a wonderful and smooth transition. But during that time, Amber, Pastor Amber, his wife, had come on staff and started working here at the church. She was here on Sunday mornings while Pastor Corey was serving at another church somewhere else because he made a commitment to his pastor. I'm here for as long as you need me. And I remember finding out that they were coming on staff. I was like, man, this is going to be great. I'm so excited. Corey's going to be a great youth pastor. Man, we're going to have a great team adding them on. And then I found out that his pastor was asking him to stay on board through Easter. And I was like, that's like four months. And Easter is the most exciting Sunday of the year. It's so awesome. It's so big. It's so strong. Man, I want him to be here. I want people to know him. I want him to know people. And in my heart, I felt like, oh, man. That kind of stinks. we got to wait four months. Then he's going to come, and he's got to wait a whole of the year to experience Easter here at the bridge. But can I tell you something? He chose to serve his pastor and finish his last season strong. And I look back at that season, and I know that I know that I know that the blessing and the favor of God has been upon bridge youth because we have leaders who did their previous season well, so God brought promotion to the season that they were about to step into. Amen? <laughs> Do your seasons well because promotion doesn't come from your boss. It don't come from the government. Promotion comes from God, amen? Amen. Do your seasons well. All right. Fourth and final thing this morning. All right, if you're taking notes, number four. When waiting in faith, remember to worship in your waiting. Worship in your waiting. Oh, man, I love this point. Because this passage that we've just read It tells us that not only was David a faithful shepherd, but he was a skilled and gifted musician. In fact, it's believed that David penned many of his psalms during his season of shepherding. And it's certainly no coincidence that his most famous psalm, the 23rd psalm, came from personal experience where he writes in the 23rd psalm again that the Lord is my shepherd. I would say David learned a few things during his season of waiting. Why? Because David knew in his heart this might be a season of waiting, but it ain't going to be a time that I'm wasting. Some people look at times of waiting and say, well, I'm just over here wasting away. David's like, no, I'm going to worship God in my waiting. I'm going to draw near to him because I know he will draw near to me. And what happens when we worship God during our time of waiting? What are we doing? We're inviting the presence of God into that path and into that journey. What are you waiting on right now? What are you waiting for God to do? Can I tell you that God wants to be nearer and closer than you might give him credit for? If you will worship in your waiting, you'll find the presence of God right there in the middle of your path and in the middle of your journey. 
And David learned a whole lot about God during his time of waiting. Wow. David understood that seasons of waiting are never to be wasted. If you find yourself in a season of waiting right now, I think you should make a decision. I should make a decision just like David, that this might be a waiting time, but it is not going to be a wasted time. God does his best work in our life, molding us and shaping us during seasons of waiting. Now, we talk about worship. The very definition of worship, the word picture of worship in scripture is simply this. It's to bow our lives before God. And that's when we feel vulnerable. During seasons of waiting, we can feel vulnerable. We can get frustrated. But when we come to a season of waiting, if we will bow our lives and open up our lives, throw them all at the feet of Jesus, what we're saying is, God, I give you permission to come close to me and work in me to make me a better person for tomorrow and the thing that you're preparing me for. It doesn't have to be a wasted time, your waiting time. Don't let it be wasted. Instead, do it well and worship in your waiting. Amen? Amen. Now, in closing this morning, I want to read the final three verses or three more verses from this passage, because I think it's gonna to help to wrap all of this up. Verse 21 says, so David came to Saul and stood before him. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became, or excuse me, David became Saul's armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. So it was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul, talking about that tormenting, distressing spirit, that David would take a harp or a lyre and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. So look at this picture. David knows he's anointed to one day occupy that palace. You've gotta understand that after David was anointed, God did not thrust him onto a throne quickly. Instead, he slowly positioned him in the palace. Now, you gotta check, just catch this, because this is incredible. Often when God makes a promise to us, we wanna hurry up and make that thing happen right now. And when we take things into our own hands, sometimes we get in God's way. But David went out and he did his season of waiting well. He worshiped in the waiting, and guess what? One day, he didn't have to go looking for a position in the palace. The people who served in the palace, they came looking for him. And if we will do our season of waiting well, what we're gonna find is that we don't have to go looking for opportunity. Opportunity is gonna come looking for us. Because it's not wasted time, it's just waiting time. I'm gonna be faithful in my field and I'm gonna worship my way through my waiting. When waiting in faith, we must remember that God often moves us in steps rather than leaps. But if we'll take the little steps that God is calling us to take today, pretty soon he's gonna position us within the proximity of the promise that he's made us. Don't be afraid of your waiting season. Do your waiting season well. Be faithful in your field. Worship in your waiting. Don't be discouraged that God doesn't take you forward in big leaps. Be satisfied with the small steps because God is positioning you within the proximity of the promise that he's made you. Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. But God, when I'm waiting, I just get worn out. I get tired. I get frustrated because waiting sucks. I don't feel like I'm being renewed. I don't feel like I'm being refreshed. I feel like I'm being drained. That's because the word wait doesn't mean to sit here and do this. It's because in the original writings, the word wait quite literally means to wrap myself around the promises of God. So often we get wrapped up in the worries of this world, the timeline that we prefer, the way that we think God ought to do it, and God says, no, wrap yourself around my promises, my word, my people, my presence, and I promise you, you will be renewed on the journey. You're not gonna get drained, you're gonna find joy in the journey. Let's do our waiting well, Bridge family because God is moving even if we don't see it, amen? amen? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? God, we've prayed so many prayers over the last few weeks for people who are believing you for amazing things, and today I continue to believe that you are moving in people's lives even if we don't see it. So today, Father, we choose to remember 
that the promise you've made us, the favor that's on us is greater than the questions that surround us. That God, you're moving even if we don't see it. We will be faithful in our field and we will worship in our waiting. We thank you, Father, that we are walking on the path you've called us to in Jesus' name. You're bringing answers in Jesus' name. You're bringing destinies in Jesus' name. Bringing wisdom in Jesus' name. You're bringing healing in Jesus' name. You're bringing provision in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and the one thing that you need above all else is a relationship with God. You might say, Zach, all that stuff sounds awesome, but I don't even have the most foundational thing, which is just that relationship with God. I wanna tell you how much God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his very best, Jesus, in exchange for your very worst, your sin. Jesus went to the cross. He died a death that we deserved for our sin, and he took all of that punishment upon him so that we could be forgiven. But he didn't just die, three days later, God raised him from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave so that you and I would not have to face it in eternity. And all we have to do is put our faith in that sacrifice that Jesus made for us, believing that he has given us new life and we too will be saved. I'm gonna pray a prayer here in just a moment. We're all gonna pray it together out loud. And if you wanna get in on this prayer and commit your life to Christ and come into a relationship with God, repeat these words after me, mean it with everything inside of you. And say, Jesus, I thank you for going to the cross for me. I believe you are the son of God and that your death was full payment for my sin. And I believe you were raised from the dead so that I could have new life. So I choose you, I surrender to you, and I will follow you from this day forward until I see you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. amen.